For years in my classes and talks and video work, I've been telling stories of one sort or another, usually to illustrate some sort of point. And I've never really done much storytelling just on its own in, in the case of these videos, although it's something that we do quite a lot in my family and in my circles of friends, not in any sort of polished professional way like you might see going to those, those storytelling outings or, or events. But I thought it'd be kind of cool to start telling some of my own stories that I remember from you know my childhood, my, my teens and 20s, from other points. So here is the very first one of those. When I was a child growing up in the 70s out on the border of the village of Wales and the township of Delafield in a subdivision that never really took off for, for years called the Hills of Delafield, where my, my dad, now having a good job, had a, a house built for us that took quite a long time to furnish and actually finish out you know we had uh, bare wood floors for for quite some time and carpeted one room at a time as uh, he drew on his paychecks to do that growing up out there one of the rare treats for us that we would indulge in maybe once a month or so was getting to go out somewhere for dinner and there was a hot dog and root beer stand called dog and suds that we could drive to that was near the intersection of Highway uh, 83, which is a state highway, and Interstate 94. Almost nothing else out there at that time. It was just all woods. That was, that was actually like by Delafield, which is to the north of, of Wales. And we really lived much closer to Wales. We were like basically on, on the border there. I ended up going to Wales Elementary, and we actually had a phone number for Genesee Depot, which is even further south of, of there. In any case, um, you know, there was the Dog and Suds and there were a few other places that we could go to. There was a supper club. And then eventually there was this place called Max's. And Max's was a tavern. So this was, this was a place that my dad, and then later when he came to live with us, my grandpa would, would go and have some beers. And it was kind of your typical, 1970s Wisconsin tavern, not very well lit, kind of grimy, smoke everywhere because everybody smoked constantly, including my dad and my grandpa. And he would sometimes stop off after work. He worked in Milwaukee and had about an hour commute. Sometimes he'd stop off and have a beer and then come home. And sometimes we would stop there for other things. And what I remembered most about it before it became... A, a place where you could actually have, have supper. And they had a few things you could eat there, mostly I think like chips or maybe they could make hamburgers or something, was, you know, my dad would come in and he would sit down and they, they'd pour a beer and he'd sit there and chit chat with the guys and he'd give me some quarters to go play some games. And one of the things that was really interesting, I mean, the arcade games were becoming big in the, the late 70s and so you could play some of those, but they had this bowling game. And my sister and I used to love to play it. And it, I, I've, you know, I, I should research this. I've never found it anywhere else. You had something like a, a puck, except it was made out of metal. And you pushed it down the, the aisle, which was, um, you know, supposed to represent a bowling alley. And it was, it was kind of waxed and it would like run over things. And then these, these pins would go up and it was essentially an analog machine. Although I think there might've been some digital components to it, like the scorekeeping mechanism. Again, kind of one of a kind thing. I've, I've never seen it anywhere else. And we used to love playing that game. And of course it consumed quarters and quarters were quite a bit of money back then. So, you know, you had to kind of nurse them. You didn't play them all at once. Um, you know, I suppose, you know, rich kids probably could, but if you were, we were sort of solidly middle class then when my dad was alive and, and working and, and uh, we were doing what we felt to be quite well. So Max's was a place where, you know, I would see my dad hanging out with these other guys who I didn't know, and they'd all be, you know, smoking, sitting around the bar, chatting about different things. And 
he'd be there with his, you know, white hair and his, his, you know, uh, salt and pepper mustache, looking older than his years, you know, having a, a beer and, and talking with them. And then eventually Max got real smart and he realized that there weren't a lot of restaurants around in the Wales area other than, you know, the Whistling Toad down to the south, which is a supper club, which was kind of pricey. So he decided to build an addition and in the addition, he put out a whole bunch of tables. So it became a restaurant and he started doing Friday fish fries. And so this was a big thing for us. You know, now we could actually go out more than once a month because there'd be specials so we could save some money and the food was really good. I, I remember it, it, it being quite tasty. And so by then my grandfather, my dad's dad was living with us and it would be all five of us, that is my, my mom, my dad, my grandpa, my sister, uh, and then me, all going out and getting a table and we'd sit around and chit chat and do all the sort of things that you'd have in a place. First, of course, the bread would come and, you know, they'd tell you, don't load up on bread, you know, and we'd have the option of getting kitty cocktails, which would be like a Shirley Temple, which I think is just like basically grenadine and soda, maybe with something else. There was a, like a cherry added to it. We could get grasshoppers, but they were not alcoholic as far as I know, you know. And here's the story that I, I really want to tell because I think it's kind of a funny one. So, you know, we would go to this fish fry and you had all these different options. And that was really cool too, because, you know, I think we kind of take this for granted. Now you go into a restaurant and there's like a million different possibilities for just about anywhere that you, you might go. And a lot of places back then just didn't have that sort of variety or what they had wasn't really that good. So Max's, it was basically like steaks of different sorts. I think he also had like pork chops and chicken. And then it, because it was Friday, you had all sorts of fish stuff. So you had like, you know, your choice of different fish. You could get shrimp, you could get lobster, you could get combination plates of different sorts. And I, I remember I was 10 years old when my dad and my grandpa made a bet. Now I was a kid who could eat. And, you know, looking at me now, you might say, yeah, well, of course you were. I was super, super skinny. I was so skinny from like, you know, my, my childhood into my early teen years that I didn't like to wear short sleeve shirts because they showed how skinny my arms were. And as it turns out, my adopted dad, my dad, you know, I'd usually just call him. He also was like super skinny as a kid. I was so skinny that my ribs like stuck out and and I could eat and eat and eat and eat. And they'd seen me eat, my dad and my grandpa. You know, like my dad would make ribs and they, they'd talk about me eyeing up stuff. Like I'd be eating and I'd already be looking at the next thing that I was going to get, like a, you know, a cob of corn or ribs or whatever it was going to be, right? And so my dad said to his dad, I bet Greg can eat a full-size steak and a lobster tail. Because that was one of the options. It was like one of the big entrees that you could get for Max's place. And my grandpa said, no, nah, that kid's not going to eat that much. There's no way that's going to happen. And they said this after I'd already like loaded up on some bread. And I think we had hors d'oeuvres too. Another thing that they'd bring is like uh, pickles and olives and carrot sticks and stuff like that. And, you know, being the kind of kid I was, I'd eat everything that was put in front of me. I'd even eat the parsley off the plate, the non-functional garnish. So my dad said, well, what do you think? Are you, are you still hungry enough? Can you, can you eat this? I think it was like a 12 ounce New York strip steak and a big lobster tail. And these were not little lobster tails, like the, the restaurants that are kind of cheap give you. This, this thing was like, you know, big sized, right? And I was like, yeah, of course I can. And I never had lobster before that, too. So I was kind of taking a, a chance. But I was the kind of kid who almost liked eating everything anyway. The only thing that I didn't like that we would have sometimes was liver. And that's a whole different culinary conversation. So, you know, they, you know, they shake hands and, and they bet 10 bucks. <laughs> and that was a lot of money back then, right, in the 1970s. And then my dad said, listen. If you win this, win me this 10 bucks, I'm giving you five bucks of that money. And I said, oh, okay, now I've got a real incentive. And I, then I turned to my grandpa and I said, 
what about you? What if I lose? And he said, you're not getting anything from me. I'm keeping the whole 10 bucks. And so now I had like a double incentive, actually a triple incentive. I love to eat and I wanted to like, you know, help my dad out. And I was going to get five bucks out of it, which could go quite a long way. I mean, back then a candy bar was a quarter. So, you know, think about how much candy that could, could buy. So they bring it out and it's on this giant plate, right? So I start, you know, cutting into the steak and it's good. You know, and I start eating the lobster tail and that's good too, you know, and I'm filling up and filling up and I, I more or less like wolf the whole steak down. And probably in retrospect, what I should have done is eat the lobster first and then eat the steak after because the lobster is richer. And, you know, I get, I get all of that done. And then there's probably like a third of the lobster tail left on the plate. And I'm feeling really like stuffed, like full, you know, like to the point where I don't know if I can eat anymore. And my grandpa's looking, he's like, see, I told you he's not going to be able to eat that. And that kind of put me over the edge. I was, uh, you know, I won't say I said like, screw you or anything like that. I was, I was not uh, that sort of kid back then, although it would become so later on. But I was like, well, who are you to tell me I can't eat all of this food? And so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and it was, I'm not going to say it's like a marathon or some, some silly thing like that, but it was an effort to, you know, eat this stuff. I kind of felt like I might, you know, throw up or something, but I'm forcing the food down and my dad and my grandpa and everybody else around the table too is watching. And then people at the other tables are all kind of in on it as well. Cause they've heard my dad and grandpa talking and my mom is getting a little bit, you know, sort of alternately embarrassed and also enjoying the attention. I don't know what my sister was doing because I was concentrating on that plate. I was, you know, single-minded. I'm like, I'm not going to throw this up because then I'll lose the bet. You know, I'm going to get this food down and then I'm going to get my, my $5 and my moment of glory. And I did it. You know, I, I, I got it down and I won't say that I actually enjoyed the last bit of that meal the way I did the front end of that meal, but I managed to do it. And then, you know, my grandpa paid over the, the 10 bucks and my dad gave me the five bucks right there. And then we, you know, eventually they, they, they had dessert. I didn't have any dessert. Of course, I was just sitting there and, uh, you know, just stuffed to the gills, as we say. And then we went home and I had kind of a stomach ache, but I had $5 more. I didn't have a wallet back then. I had $5 more in my pocket and I knew that I could do it and that I liked steak and lobster together. So, you know, I kind of learned some sort of lesson in the process. And so did my grandpa. Don't bet against this kid eating stuff. So there's my story, not a particularly edifying one, but perhaps an interesting and enjoyable one.